All right, thank you for joining us for our Sunday morning service. Turning your hymnals to number 340 and sing from home. My faith has found a resting place. A beautiful song to begin this morning. Thinking about those words as we sing them out. My faith has found a resting place. My faith has found a resting place. Not in device nor creed. just a couple of pages number 360 360 as we sing there is a fountain there is a fountain filled with blood singing out all five verses this morning there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunge beneath the blood whose all
Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you, and once again, Lord, we cannot uh, be physically assembled together, but we ask that you would still encourage us through the singing of the great hymns of the faith, through praying, through trying to join our hearts together, even though we're separated by distance, through the preaching of your word. We ask that you would bless each part of this service, that it would touch hearts and lives that we would gain information from your word that would teach us how we should live in these difficult times. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's sing that next hymn. All right, join me in singing from home number 26 as we sing, Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, as we know that no matter what's going on around us, this is true, that God is faithful to us. Great is thy faithfulness as we sing all three verses this morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Before the message this morning, we've asked Julia and Hannah to bring us a special one song. Listen closely to the words and let them comfort your heart and prepare you for the preaching. My soul was 
was lost in sin there was no peace within and jesus came to me and set my spirit free and now i know i'm saved eternal life he gave i'm in the savior's hand he's in the father's i'm in the savior's hand he's in the father's what blessed security for all eternity no man can pluck me out there is no need to doubt i'm in the savior's hand he's in the father's so now my life i give for him i'll ever live i'll daily take my cross i'll gladly suffer loss for from this veil of tears he has removed all fears i'm in the savior's hand he's in the father's i'm in the savior's hand he's in the father's what blessed security for all eternity no man can block me out there is no need to doubt i'm in the savior's hand he's in the father's prepared a place where I shall see his face I'll worship at his feet that day when we shall meet for from this veil of tears he has removed all fears I'm in the Savior's hand he's in the Thank you for that song this morning. It just fits so well with the message. If you would turn in your Bibles to Psalm 37. This is a uh, passage that we uh, go to regularly here. In fact, uh, uh, I was just looking through my notes and uh, not exhaustively, of course, but uh, I don't believe there's been one of these 28 years that... Uh, I have been the pastor of this church that uh, I have not preached at least part of this psalm, if not uh, spent an entire uh, service on Psalm 37. It's one of those places in my Bible, uh, as I'm going through, my Bible falls open to Psalm 37. There is just some great, great truths here and instruction that you and I would do well to take heed to. Now, I do want you to uh, challenge you to listen to the whole sermon. If you just listen to part of my introduction, you're going to think that I'm just uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, losing my place and ranting against what's going on around us. And that is not the case. We are really, uh, I am really going somewhere. So please uh, buckle your seatbelts, uh, pay attention, stay here, keep your Bible open to Psalm 37. And... Uh, 
I, I think uh, a statement that uh, we need to just make here is to understand that there's an awful lot of stuff going on right now that just does not make sense. The numbers just do not add up. Every time you listen to the news, every time you hear the reports, uh, you hear of people dying, and we're not trying to minimize this in, in any way. There are many families that are bereaved and suffering, and each story uh, is told that if you do not continue social distancing, uh, we're all going to die. Now, we go back a few weeks here. Uh, when we started our study in the book of Job, we realized, we, I hope you did, but uh, I tried to bring forth that that kind of reasoning there is, is the devil speaking. This is not a saying. This is not anything uh, that makes any sense, but it is something that they want to put us uh, in, in fear. And, uh, and uh, you, I want to remind you that these are the same people that every time we get a nor'easter, they try to scare the living daylights out of us. Uh, these are the same people uh, that had uh, our city so petrified of storms that by the time Superstorm Sandy actually rolled in and there was some danger that nobody was paying any attention to the warnings that were given because they were so dire. And uh, we, we need a little dose of reality and I want to make, make a statement here. we got to balance it here. we got to make sure because we just have nuts on all sides of this thing. It makes good sense not to just go about life as normal or to try to catch this thing uh, or to take the possibility that you might be passing it on to others. We do need to use a little sense. And, but let's just look at some of these numbers here. As of Friday, April 24th, the total number of uh, positive cases that were actually tested in New York is 148,498. Do the math. That's still less than 2% of the population of New York City. Uh, what that means is you got to be pretty lucky to catch this thing. Uh, you have a 98% chance of not catching this disease at this point. A and should you win that lottery and be one of that 2%, uh, that means that of that 2%, 7% of those, according to the numbers, have died from this disease. Now, we have to be careful. Because percentages are still people. There's a problem though. They're doing the antibody test. And now they're saying everybody's had it. The 7% a death rate now goes down to a 0.5% death rate. And that presents a problem for the doomsayers and the nay, uh, naysayers and the people who believe that uh, if we don't grab a hold of our bootstraps and try real hard, we're all going to die. Uh, you see, we've got real numbers. We have real people suffering. But... It, it is time to start asking those in charge. Of course, they're not going to listen. Uh, is all of this, was all of this necessary? Uh, the statement I like to, to just simply put out there for you to think of. When in American history have we done so much for so few? Uh, my favorite, if somebody is good at social media, you're on Twitter, start a new hashtag. God is not spelled G-O-V. Uh, see if we can uh, make that thing take off. I'm not good at that stuff. I am not twitting. Uh, of course, I said I am not texting, and I text the, the sermon links every uh, service now. And so I, I may end up backing up on that, but... Uh, I'd rather have a real conversation than an abbreviated or pretend one. 
Uh, I don't believe in abbreviated prayers. And, and if you want to talk, call me. I will talk to you if it's at all possible. But I, I do believe the time is now here that we need to start asking these people in charge, is this really, was this really necessary? But then if you start thinking about this, this is where it starts getting really scary. If this isn't necessary, if this wasn't necessary, what are these people doing who are doing these things? Uh, what is the real agenda? I am not a black helicopter guy. Uh, never have been, and Lord willing, uh, never will be. And of course, I was told by one of them, he says, you will be the day they come to take you away. Uh, maybe so. But like I said before, if that is what's going to happen, me worrying about it and putting on my tinfoil hat to protect me from cosmic rays is not going to help one little bit. And, and I'm getting to that in the sermon, but I, I do want you to take a, a, a short journey with me down this dark, scary road. Any thinking American has, has to begin to ponder the possibility of losing our greatest asset. That's individual freedom. Uh, I feel like I'm in the second grade most of the time when I leave this building. I have to stand in line to go to the store and I have to have my mask on, I have to have my gloves on, and if I uh, happen to rip a, a strap on my uh, mask or, or uh, cut a hole in my glove on the shop, they won't let me in the store. I mean, this is, this is worse than the lines at the bathroom in the second grade. I mean... Come on, people. But a second factor here we're talking about is the time involved. Do you realize we've already passed a month since our governor has locked down this state? And I do want to tell you that I'm thankful uh, that we don't live in the state of Michigan. Uh, I'm thankful that we don't live in Colorado. They arrested a father for playing catch with his daughter in an empty park in the state of Colorado last week. Uh, you, you make sense of some of this stuff. I mean, we've had police officers uh, in, in Mississippi knocking on windows of, of people who were visiting church. Their windows were rolled up. They were listening on their radio in the church. And the police officers are breaking the social distancing rules to give them tickets to show up in a parking lot. Uh, I'm thankful that our attorney general stepped in and said, hey, you're not going to single out churches and we're going to be watching. And, and I'll tell you what, we're church and we're going to be looking for every opportunity. Uh, if they can social distance at the grocery store, we can social distance at church. Uh, there's some things that we can do, and I want you to be praying about that. But would you please wash your hands? There, there's nothing wrong with that. Wash it till the skin comes off. Uh, it'll do you some good. It, 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 we need to be careful. I do wear one of those silly little masks when I go out because the rule is that I don't want to give somebody something I don't have. And if that makes sense to you, uh, write, send me an email or something and I will try to uh, uh, follow along there. But uh, listen, all of this said, we've got a serious amount of fretting going on. Fretting is not just for guitars and mandolins and banjos. Uh, I think they fret on a cello too, don't they? No. Okay, and, uh, uh, but the simple truth here is we have to stop worrying about things that we cannot change. One of the most frustrating things here is that no one in government is going to listen to the people that put them there. You have to understand that winning an election takes the least of us mentally, morally, and spiritually. And if you have any questions, just look at the people who have been elected to public office from our wonderful city here. Uh, and it changes them into metahumans 
with powers beyond comic book characters. I mean, they know how to solve every problem. And they're going to thank us if we do what they say. Uh, I, I'm tired of that. I'm angered at that. We, we live in New York City. Many of the greatest and most incredible inventions in the history of the world have been done by people who live in this city and in this area. Uh, we are not running out of people who know how to live. In fact, uh, the, what has made America such a great country and down through history is when we are allowed to have the freedom to do those things and to make our own choices. And I don't know about you, but I've had to deal with a little bit of fretting. I've had to think in my mind, what would I tell that mayor if I could? He's not going to listen to me. He doesn't care no matter what he says. Only with people who already agree with what he already agrees with. That, that's the definition of a politician. And if we're not careful, we're going to get ourselves all tied in knots and the answer I'm going to give you today, now, now we're making the transition here. I hope I've given you enough to worry about here. And, and if you weren't worried before, you probably are now. Well, uh, now, now we're going to look at the Bible and find the Bible's answer. It's right here in Psalm 37. It starts out with fret not. Three times in this psalm we're told to fret not. Stop worrying about it. Uh, don't get the, uh, the agita going and the, the mind just runs in directions and we get thinking about this and that and this and that. And blah, 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 blah. I've often joked about uh, uh, when I'm on the campus at Heartland Baptist Bible College at our college campuses, especially Bible colleges, are the greatest repository of knowledge known to mankind because the students show up knowing everything. And by the time they leave, if they actually got an education, uh, they say, boy, I, I don't even begin to know the answers. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm, but I got a book and I know where to search those answers and I know how to preach this book and I know how to pray. And Lord willing, we're going to find what it means to live for God. So where would all that knowledge go? It must be there somewhere. And uh, uh, we, we've just got to... Get into the word of God. And no, please do not mistake me. This is not a Joel Olstein message. Uh, this is not a don't worry, be happy song. Uh, we have real instruction. We have real activities here. We have things that we are supposed to do. And the Bible tells us things we are not supposed to do. And so let's look through this psalm. We're going to look through the first uh, few verses where these three fret knots are recorded. And then we're going to try to line up the rest of this psalm with uh, because it endorses, it goes back. This is a song that was meant to be sung. And so there's quite a bit of repetition here and, and uh, uh, supporting verses. And so let's just dive in. Verse 1 of chapter 37 it says, fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. So here is the command, fret not, don't worry yourself, don't just sit there and get all tied up saying, well, well, uh, there, there are wicked people out there and there are people who are plotting things and people who are doing, the Bible says, fret not thyself because of evildoers. This, this is not a uh, hermeneutically difficult verse. Uh, that is the theological term for understanding your Bible. is called hermeneutics. Fret not because of the evildoers. It's, it's saying, don't worry. Stop getting yourself all wound up because evildoers exist. And don't be envious against the workers of iniquity. You know what? There have been evil doers on this planet since Cain killed Abel. And I mean, we could run down through the list and 
uh, and, and we have to be careful. I mean, there's a lot of people putting memes of our mayor out there with a Hitler mustache because he's telling everybody to report the uh, quarantine breakers. And, and uh, I, I have probably caught myself using the term brown shirt more than once and, uh, in reference. And that's, that's just not right. The Bible says, fret not thyself because of evildoers. Worrying about what the evildoers are doing only takes my attention away from the Word of God. It only saps my strength to have faith and it keeps me from putting my full effort. Actually, if you really want to know what fretting does, it empowers the workers of iniquity. It gives strength to them. If you want to make the devil happy, pay attention to him. If you want him to leave you alone, pay attention to Jesus. It's just that simple. Uh, all the time, uh, not so much since all this COVID-19, but on a fairly regular basis. Oh, yes, I, I did get a call just, uh, just as everything was starting. This young, uh, uh, I've, got, I, I, I've got problems. Do you, do you deal with possession and do you deal with this? And, and so I, I gave him a homework assignment. I said, take your Bible out and read the Gospel of John and call me back in two days. Well, he gave me his phone number, so I called him back in two days, in three days, in four days. And I finally gave up because I don't think... He wants to hear about anything. You see, if you're going to defeat the devil, you got to stop thinking about him. It says, Neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. Have you ever wondered why people love vampires and gangsters? I mean, that just seems to be the two themes that keep going over and over again. And uh, then the last one is filthy rich people who can buy and sell other people as they want. I mean, uh, and you boil this whole down, it is a fascination with power. Power over other human beings. You wonder what our politicians are doing? You need to pray for them because they have been given the biggest power grab in the history of the United States. Never before have these little uh, sheriffs and mayors and governors and, and people who ordinarily have very little to say about all of a sudden they're gods. Little g, little o, little ds. Let's get that spelled right. That's heady stuff. I'll tell you, you get a taste of that drug and it's hard to stop. And we need to pray about that. But you know what some people are doing? They're sitting at home wishing they could be like the mayor, telling people where they're going to put on, or governor, put on mask. And the mayor says, let's do this. And the governor says, ha, you're going to do that. Why? Because he's got more power than the mayor has. And the president says something and our governor says, oh, no, you're not. You're not taking my power away from me. Oh, my goodness. Let's get out the toys and put up the pads on the floor and let them have a nursery. But unfortunately, they're running the country right now. If you want to study some history, study the presidency of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. The reason the liberals love him is because he made himself a god in this country. And I had relatives. My aunt was married. My father's older sister was married in the Great Depression. My father was born during the Great Depression. And they would tell me stories. I remember my Aunt Mary Jane sitting me down and just saying, you know, bread, a loaf of bread only cost a nickel, she said. But by gum, you didn't have the nickel to go buy it. She said, we get our paycheck and I'd, I'd take 50 cents over here and a dollar over here and 50 cents over here and a quarter there. And if we could keep our credit, we, we were able to eat and stay in our apartment and not lose our, 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 the place where we were living. And a lot of people were homeless back then. An old FDR showed up. If you study history, any honest history, he made the depression worse 
and longer than it needed to be. But he had good PR people and he, he would wake up in the morning after becoming president and decide the price of gold. You know what they do to you if you tried that today? They put you in jail. He got away with an awful lot of stuff. You see, what was the temptation that the devil gave Eve in the garden? He shall become as gods. It, you got to remember something, folks. The devil has nothing new. It's just the foolishness of man that keeps him biting at the same uh, bait. And, and there's people who are envious again. Well, I, I wish I had that power. I wish I could just get up and tell everybody what the Bible says. Don't waste your time fretting because of the existence of evildoers or fretting and thinking and being envious that you don't have the same power that they do, that it isn't fair. Some people take it to the next step and say, you got to fight fire with fire. You know, that's not very smart. The only time you fight fire with fire is when you have no physical hope of getting enough water to put out the fire. You fight fire with water. And even with all of these uh, uh, wildfires we had going on a little while back here, it rained and that's when they all ended. I'll tell you, you got to understand, don't be envious. Here's Look at verse 3. It says, trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Stanza 2, delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Verse 5, stanza 3, commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. And he shall bring forth thy righteousness as a light, and thy judgment as the noonday. Verse 7, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Now we're going to stop because that's the next fret knot. And we're going to get there in just a minute here. But do you see what the writer is telling us? He said, if you're going to fret not because of evildoers, if you're not going to be envious of the workers of iniquity you got to trust in the Lord. Now, this is an amazing thing to me. I, I have never failed to, to just be simply amazed at how many people say, oh, trusting in the Lord, I do that every day. Now, let me ask you a straight question. If you were to die today, would you know for sure that the angels would be ushering your soul into the presence of Almighty God? Well, uh, <clears throat> you know, nobody knows that. Well, wait a minute. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that ye may know that ye have eternal life and that ye might believe on the name of the Son of God. This whole book called the Bible is given to us so that we can know, not so that we can hope so. What does it mean to trust in the Lord if you do not have your eternity settled? The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And here's the question. Well, Lord, I do that every day. I believe on, why do I still have these doubts? Uh, could it be because you're not believing on the Lord Jesus Christ? You're believing on a Lord Jesus Christ. I, I We've had people, that, they're not uh, members of our church right now. I'm thinking of actually several over the years that later on they said, well, you know, when I first started coming to this church, I still kept going to uh, Mass at the Catholic Church just to make sure. Uh, that's not faith. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ means faith in Jesus alone. Faith in the finished work. When Jesus was on the cross, uh, one of the things that I am so looking forward to is the screen here is just 
quite, not quite big enough to get the, it is finished on the wall behind the platform here. And I like to reference that because Jesus said it is finished. If it is finished, then why are you still trying to do what Jesus Christ finished? That's not very wise. In fact, that leads to a lot of fretting and a lot of envious behavior here. And it tells me that if I'll trust in the Lord and do good, that I'll dwell in the land and I'll be fed. And so I'm just going to trust God with those things. It says, delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. And this is not the, uh, the main thrust of the message this morning, but one of the most perverted verses in all the Bible. Uh, I don't sit here and give kudos to God and blow kisses to Jesus and then demand that he give me everything I want. Uh, the, if I delight myself in the Lord, that means he has written over my heart and my desires, his desires. And then he has no choice but to give me those desires that are in my heart because they're no longer mine, they're his. Verse 5 says, commit thy way unto the Lord. Now that word commit is an interesting word. We use it all the time. Did you commit the crime? Well, were you the one that actually did it? And of course, you're never going to get anybody to say yes. I mean, it was always their friend. It was always someone else's fault. Um, last week, we were putting, I was, actually, I was putting up the scaffolding at uh, Union because of our wonderful governor saying you could only have one person on the work site. And I'll tell you what, it was getting toward the end of the day and I started climbing up this ladder just, uh, it was only about 18 feet in the air and the scaffolding started rocking back and forth and and I couldn't swing my leg up over, and, I, and uh, I'd carried about 40-some uh, uh, planks, weighing 50 pounds apiece. So you start doing the math, uh, carrying them up and moving them here, and then lifting them up and moving them to the second level. And I knew that all I had to do to get up on that top level was just commit. But I couldn't do it. So I went home, got some rest. And you know what? It was a whole lot easier the next day. It just really was. Uh, the word commit means to follow through. It means uh, if you're a paratrooper that you leave the plane. Now, now you're committed to the parachute. Uh, and uh, just to remind you, all parachutes come with a lifetime guarantee. If they ever fail to operate, just return them for a full refund. Uh, that's what the Civil Air Patrol guy told me when I was a kid when we visited the station there in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, but can I ask you a question? Can you trust God enough to just simply be obedient to him? That's what it, commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him. He shall bring it to pass. I remember all the fear and trepidation that I had in my heart when we committed ourselves. We signed the papers to buy this building. Uh, one of the most terrifying events in my life. I just realized that my name is on a piece of paper saying that I'm going to give these guys $600,000 in three years. I'm sitting there going... Well, wait a minute. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Okay, Lord, it's committed. It's your turn now. It sure is a lot easier when you've committed unto the Lord instead of yourself. It says here that if we'll commit our way unto the Lord, that he shall bring forth thy righteousness as a light and thy judgment as the noonday. One of the reasons why our righteousness fails and our commitment and our understanding, our judgment, our ability to comprehend really what's going on around us and the difference between right and wrong is these things are coming from our own efforts and our own thought processes when they're supposed to be the result of committing our way unto the Lord Jesus Christ and our obedience to him. 
Now that's fret not number one. Fret not number two comes in verse seven. It says, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Now this might be a little more complicated, but if you take it apart, it says, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. That's the opposite of fretting. And it says, fret not thyself. Do not get yourself worked up. Do not allow yourself to be uh, consumed with worry and, and frustration. Why? Because of him who prospereth in his way. Okay, so we're not supposed to get upset about people who... Uh, have success, but then it qualifies that success. People who have success, people who prosper, people who get ahead because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. The first fret not tells us that we're not to fret and we're not to be envious of the presence of evildoers. The second fret not is we're not to fret because of the success of evildoers. You know, there are times when it feels like the whole world is falling apart and God is silent and the devil's winning every game. It, it just feels like that sometimes. And, and I will tell you that it just feels, if we're not careful... It just seems like the devil's crowd is winning this whole COVID-19 debate. Uh, they're getting everything they want. We have a lawmaker here in Queens laughing because oil prices crashed. And uh, don't you love it? No, no, we don't. Because those are good paying jobs. Those are other people who are doing essential work but you see, they're oil people, so they're dirty in her perverted, strange little mind. She gets national headlines. And if everything goes really well, we'll probably have 150 views of this service. Now, that's just not right. The truth ought to get a better hearing than the silly little girl from Queens. But you know something? The Bible says, don't worry about it. That I'm to rest in the Lord. That I'm supposed to understand that these people who bring wicked devices to pass are still under the providence and the providence of God. Providence is the action that God takes. Providence is the authority that God has to take those actions. And, and uh, we have to rest in the Lord. We have to remember that I'm not in charge. God is. And that's an awful nice thought. You know, most of us, we criticize many of the things that these politicians are doing and they, they deserve to be criticized. They really do. But if we were to try to handle the pressures of that job, most of us would fall apart in a matter of hours. Uh, I marvel at our president and what he has put up with. I pray for him. Uh, you talk about someone with extraordinary powers. I mean, the level of hatred and angst and everything he says is just... Turn they made a big deal about what he was saying about light and disinfectant the other day in one of the news conferences. And he has to come back the next day and said, I was being sarcastic. Uh, you know what he was really saying? I just want to see how stupid you news people are. If you're going to jump, I knew you'd jump on this and try to make headlines out of it, so I'm going to give you something. I mean, 
I, I admire his ability, but I, I'll tell you, I, I think for me, I need to rest in the Lord instead of fretting and trying to figure it out. I need to wait patiently for him. Because I want to remind you, I, I've read this book and it tells me the end of all things. And it's not very good for those who stand opposed to God. Because this last fret knot kind of puts everything in context here. Verse 8, cease from anger and forsake wrath. Uh, I think I've needed that more than once this week and uh, I'm going to need it more than once next week. Uh, and, and you're going to need it as well. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. So I want you to see the full scope of these three fret nots. Number one, fret not because there are evil people doing evil things in this world. Fret not because of their presence. Fret not. Don't be envious of them. Don't wish that you had their power and their authority. Number two, in verse seven, don't fret because they're successful or seemingly successful in what they do. I mean, I don't know how many people I knew when Bill Clinton wasn't impeached and how depressed uh, I was and many preachers I knew and we just couldn't understand why this thing. And, and there were other people that were rejoicing because he got away with it. Well, the Bible tells you and I to fret not because of the prosperity of the wicked. Uh, may I remind you, remember about Bernie Madoff. I mean, he made off with an awful lot of stuff, but it didn't end well, and it still is not ending well for that man. But this last one is fret not, because what really happens if you're not careful about this fretting thing is you're going to be out there joining the evildoers. Whatever you do, don't help out the evil doers. There are people who are just looking for excuses for civil disobedience to try to do something wrong. I'll show them. Well, about the only thing you're going to show them is your wrist. Uh, uh, they'll show you the back seat of a police cruiser. Uh, listen, that's, that's not what we want to do here. Cease from anger. Forsake wrath. You're not going to get anything done because you're upset about this thing. Uh, remember, they're not listening to you. Why? Because they are evildoers. The only prospering they're going to have is when they do something wrong. And the Bible says, I'm not to worry about them being there. I'm not to worry about their success. And I'm certainly not supposed to help them. And so now let's go back. And I know there's a lot more of this psalm that's ahead of us than behind us. But. These are the three main points here that I want us to bring forward. And you'll find out that the rest of the psalm kind of breaks down and, and just uh, uh, reiterates and repeats these thoughts and ideas, remembering that Hebrew poetry is not a rhyming of words, but a rhyming of thoughts. And so we start out with the first fret not for the presence of evildoers. And in verse 2 that we skipped before, we're coming back. It gives us the reason for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. You know, the evildoers are not going to be here long. Now, I want to warn you that many people down through the centuries and millennia of time have suffered because of the evildoers. I have a painting in, in uh, it's, it's a copy of a painting in my office just to 
remind me, I, I saw it at a preacher's meeting one time, and I, I said, boy, I'd just like to, to think about that, of the Circus Maximus in the city of Rome. And, of course, that was one of the first things that happened after Constantine became the emperor was the destruction of the circus. They tell us that uh, the circus at Maximus, or the main circus, the big circus in Rome, held 600,000 people. This is where the gladiators fought. Uh, this was where the Christians were burned. Uh, Nero would, uh, not to be too graphic here, but he would take stakes uh, and put them around the inside of the arena and dip people in pitch and use them as human torches to light the arena at night so the people could see the games as they fed people to lions and as they did these horrible things in graphic color. And, and before we get too upset about the barbarity of uh, the Roman Empire, uh, Check out HBO and uh, uh, whatever the other television stations are. What is it? Stars and uh, Horror Channel and Sci-Fi. and I mean, they do worse things than that on camera today. But you need to understand something. Nero was an emperor for very long. In fact, in the history of Rome, he was one of the most insignificant emperors in the entire history of that empire. And yet, it wasn't insignificant for the thousands and thousands of Christians that he tried to put to death. But God says, David speaking a thousand years before Jesus was born, they shall soon be cut down. Get over here to uh, verse 9. And it says, for evildoers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. You know, it's interesting that Constantine surrendered the Roman Empire to the Christians. And of course, if you study history, you know that Constantine wasn't really a true Bible-believing Christian. Uh, he used the Christian cross as his symbol he added it to his e Roman eagle and and said in this sign conquer and whoever holds this relic is going to be invincible and people were so glad that the persecution was stopped that they were willing to believe Constantine but I want you to know that not even Constantine endured that long but the church is still here. People who believe in Jesus are still here. Look at verse 12. The wicked plotteth against the just and gnashes upon him with his teeth. The Lord shall laugh at him for he seeth that his day is coming. See, you can either put your attention on the workers of iniquity... You can wish that you had their power or their platform to speak from. You can sit there and become envious of the wicked and all you're doing is giving them more power. All you're doing is taking your attention off Jesus Christ. We've got to stop fretting and understand that there have been and will be until that day that Jesus makes all things new. There will be evildoers. But you remember the apostles' testimony in, in Acts chapter 4? He said they all came together. The apostles said uh, the chief priests and the scribes and the Pharisees and the Romans all came together to do to Jesus the things that were prophesied of him, that God had already said were going to happen. I, I want to challenge you the, that even the most God-hating, uh, devious, evil heart on this earth cannot do things that God won't let him do. And so it's time for you and I to stop worrying about what's under God's providence, what is under his authority, and stop worrying about all those things and start being concerned about trusting in the Lord. Not delighting in the fact 
that the governor of Michigan backed up. People protested and she backed up. Uh, that's good. Uh, wait a minute. My delight needs to be in the Lord, not in the fact that I backed down the tyrant. My, my delight has to be in trusting in God and not trusting in myself to be able to do these things. Now we come down to verse 14. The wicked have drawn out the sword and they have bent their bow to cast down the poor and needy and to slay such as be of upright conversation. Their sword shall enter into their own heart and their bows shall be broken. A little that a righteous man hath is better than the riches of many wicked. You know what? Don't be fretting because of the success of evildoers. Their, their devices are against themselves. God is going to turn their wickedness to themselves. And by the way, look at verse 16. It says, a little that a righteous man hath is better than the riches of many wicked. And, and we've got to understand this thing. I stop and I'm in amazement at what people in this city say. They talk about uh, that it takes uh, $250,000 to raise a child in New York City. No, it doesn't. It doesn't take anywhere near that. And uh, they, they talk about you, you need this and you need this. You can't possibly compete with the public schools in New York. Pray tell what? I, I can't compete with the public school system? I've got a 100% graduation rate. And, and so far, I got a 100% entering college rate and a 100% college graduation rate. Uh, they can't compete with my statistics. In fact, I told one of them at the homeschool board a few years ago while I was still here in Queens. I said, I'll put my kids' SAT scores up against yours any day. He said, that's not what I'm talking about. I said, I know that's not what you're talking about because what you're talking about doesn't make a bit of sense. And uh, he couldn't answer me on that because he knew it was true. You see, I don't need... All those things. It says a little that a righteous hath. Look at verse 18. The Lord knoweth the days of the upright. Their inheritance shall be forever. They shall not be ashamed in the evil time. And in the day of famine. They shall be satisfied. But the wicked shall perish. And the enemies of the Lord shall be as the fat of lambs. They shall consume into smoke. They shall consume away. The wicked borroweth and payeth not again, but the righteous showeth mercy and giveth. Now I want you to read very carefully with, with these next few verses because uh, David is summarizing this here. For such as be blessed of him shall inherit the earth, and they that be cursed of him shall be cut off. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall, not utterly, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. I have been young and now am old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. He is ever merciful and lendeth, and his seed is blessed. David is writing this psalm obviously toward the end of his life. And he had the room to speak of personal experience. We're going through the life of David now in, in our Sunday school time, through the Bible time. And, and I hope you are watching that video as well. But now we start this last section here of fret not thyself because of the success or because of the prosperity, because the wicked are getting things done. Verse 27, depart from evil and do good. You don't fight fire with fire. You don't help God out by doing something wrong. I mean, this has been the theme uh, of every uh, uh, 
television show that I know of. I mean, uh, uh, I, I like the Lone Ranger, but if you stop and really listen to the story theme, he does some things that are absolutely illegal. In fact, I remember one show, he kidnaps the sheriff to try to help the sheriff understand that he's the good guy and he's going to do right. Uh, don't try that today. Uh, it works well if you got a good script writer, but if you don't, uh, you're going to get into serious, serious trouble. And um, we've, we've had presidents of the United States, George W. Bush said, we've got to, uh, we've got to suspend capitalism to save capitalism. Oh, so being a socialist, having the government be the answer to all the problems is going to solve something. Never has been, never will be. The answer is in the people. But again, don't be sitting there fretting because of, the, of what the wicked are doing. Look with me in verse 34. Here's a command. It says, wait on the Lord and keep his way. And he shall exalt thee to inherit the land when the wicked are cut off. Thou shalt see it. I'm looking forward to seeing it. I'll tell you that. When Jesus comes back on that white horse and the armies of this world are destroyed and he sets up his kingdom, the Bible tells me I'm going to be there and I'm going to get to see those things because I've trusted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Look at verse 37. It says, Mark the perfect man and behold the upright for the end of that man is peace. Look at verse 35. I have seen the wicked in great power and spreading himself like a green bay tree. Yet he passed away, and lo, he was not. Yea, I sought him, but he could not be found. How many people could we talk about? How many names could we put in there from the history books uh, of people who... Uh, exalted themselves and had great power and great success and all of a sudden, poof, they were gone. Now let's get down to verse 39 and verse 40 and we're going to try to tie everything up. But the salvation of the righteous is of the Lord. You can't get saved by yourself. You can't do enough good works to please God. You cannot make God save you the only way you get saved is by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. He is their strength in the time of trouble. I want you to understand something. If you're relying on anything else except obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to fail during this time. You're going to fall. You will be moved. It says, and the Lord shall help them and deliver them. He shall deliver them from the wicked and save them because they trust in him. I want to challenge you that there is no trust in God. There is no faith in God without obedience. Let me ask you a question. Have you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ? That's how we start. Fret not thyself. My attention is not on the evildoers. My attention's on the Lord Jesus Christ. He's a whole lot bigger than they are. He's much more powerful. He is in charge. And I don't have to worry about the Lord. And I don't have to worry about anything else. Amen. It, it tells me here that I'm not to be fretting because of the success of the evildoers. Number one, they're not going to be around that long. Oh, they may be along, around long enough to put this old preacher in the grave. But they're not going to be around that long. There's coming a day when Jesus is going to have the final victory and set up his kingdom here on this earth. I'm looking forward to that day. I don't want to miss out on that to be upset at somebody who God is going to judge in the first place. And then, I... I is emblazoned in my heart and mind. My wife will remember this. 
we were on deputation, we were going to churches and we were telling them about our uh, desire to start a church in New York City in the neighborhood of Astoria, Queens. And uh, this was back in uh, 1990 and uh, 91 and we walked in a church and all of a sudden we were just looking at each other. It was weird. And uh, the preacher after the service, he said, listen, I, I heard you got some mechanical ability. And I said, well, I've, I've done a few projects. He says, <coughs> excuse me. He says, I got a tank from the, uh, a riot tank from the Detroit Police Department from the 60s riots. And, and I'm, I'm looking for somebody who can put that on the road because I'm going to be ready when it happens. And I'm like, uh, yeah, no, yes, sir. Uh, uh, you know, I, I'm not the guy for that job. That's what I told him. I said, I, I really, uh, I said, we're, we're trying to get to New York City. I said, but I, I'll tell you where you can find the parts. And, and I gave him the name of a military salvage yard not too far away and said, if you go over there, if, if it's available, they'll have it. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Never gave us a dime of support. He, he wasn't worried about the gospel going forward. He's worried about him being ready when it happens. And I'll tell you what, you can't be ready when it happens. You have to let the Lord take care of those things. The worst case scenario is you're just going to go out and commit the same crimes that you're accusing them of doing. Tyranny is not the answer to tyranny. But I do want to just make one more connection before we close this all up. We spend some time in Psalm 119, verse 92. It says, unless thy law had been my delights, I should then have perished in mine affliction. I want to challenge you. Psalm 37 is a complete and total commentary on that verse. I'm not going to be ready by trying to get ready. I'm going to be ready by trusting in the Lord. I'm going to be ready by fretting not and, and by forsaking anger and by realizing that there are so many things going on in this world that I can't do a thing about. But there are some things I can do a thing about. I can keep up on my Bible reading. I can call people I know and talk to them about the Lord. We had a missionary have a little issue this week. And so I'm getting on the phone with people that I know, that people that people that know, uh, people I know, know other people. And I'm getting on the phone trying to reach out and, and be a help. Guess what? That's doing right. That's keeping your heart focused on the right things. Working on trying to prepare a message that will actually say something here. And you say, well, I'm not going to just stick my head in the sand. I'm not talking about sticking your head in the sand. I'm talking about sticking it in the book, amen? Uh, let's stop trying to solve the world's problems. They're not listening to you. But I can keep my relationship with Jesus where it ought to be. I was talking with a missionary the other day and he said yeah somebody took one of our links and sent it to uh so and so and in, in another country and they watched our our uh, uh uh church service in the philippines i believe it was and they said they got saved i said amen praise the lord you know that's that's what we need to do we need to stop trying to figure out how we're going to solve this problem and start trying to figure out how we can get as close to Jesus as we can. And to stop worrying, you cannot improve on God's work. I've not been through anything like this in my life. I don't know very many other people that have. But I'll tell you what, it's been a long struggle. And we don't know when it's going to be over. But I'll tell you this, by God's grace, I'm done fretting because I want my heart and my attention to be on the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you have your salvation settled? 
Listen, I have time to talk to you about that any time of the night or day. If you can wake me up at 2 o'clock in the morning, get me awake, I'll talk to you about Jesus. Have no problem doing that. In fact, to keep my phone right there so if somebody does call that we can answer. Now, if you're going to start asking me who the Antichrist is, I'm going to hang up on you. Uh, I don't have time to play with that. But uh, I do want you to stop worrying because of evildoers. They're there. They've been there. They're going to be there. Let God take care of that. Hey, it really looks like they're getting everything they want right now. And I know a lot of people that are really upset about that, including me. And you know what I'm doing? I'm asking God, help me not to fret. Help me not to be angry and upset because it looks like they're having success. I want to be on the right side of faith. And I don't want to help the wicked get their way. I, I will tell you, there has been time after time. Just one short story. This happened in Nebraska while I was a Bible college student in the mid-80s. A church out there, they were closed down by the... Uh, the sheriffs and they carried preachers out of the church and they arrested people. Come to find out that the whole thing that was going on there was not religious persecution. That preacher was so foolish that he didn't want to do his taxes right. Let me tell you, that's not religious freedom. That's just called plain dumb. And we, we need to understand that God judges sin. And if his people sin, he's going to judge you too. Let's be obedient. Let's make God's law our delights. We've got a lot to do. And let's not waste our time fretting. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you understand this message this morning and Lord that it would be an encouragement to those who are worried and fretting about this thing Lord that they would be more concerned about their eternal soul than they are about what's going on in our nation right now Lord that they would be more concerned about being obedient to Jesus than they are about the success of the wicked or their apparent success and Lord, I pray that there'd be no one that watches this video or hears my voice that would go so far in their fretting against the wicked, the evildoers, that they would actually join them in doing evil. Lord, help us to take our eyes off ourselves and the things we understand and put them on the cross of Jesus, on the empty tomb, on the word of God, and on living for Jesus, holy and acceptable unto God. In Jesus' name we pray. And as the uh, music plays, I would ask you to think about these things. good to have Deborah play that old accordion 
And let's take our hymn books as we're dismissed. And of course, if you have struggles in your life, if you have things you would like counseling about, please call the church here and we will do everything we can to answer and help you through that. 51 if you need the words. Take the